Okay, my guest today is Professor John Zhang. He is a Wharton professor, but more importantly, he is one of the world uh, preeminent experts on pricing stuff. He's got two, oh, he's got two PhDs. <laughs> How do. about that? Uh, two PhDs. You buy one, get one free today. Yeah, you get one free. <laughs> um, but no, he, he teaches at Wharton, which is obviously one of the most respected business schools. And his book, Smart Pricing, is something that I've been recommending for years. It's on my tylopez.com slash books. It's in my top you know, 50 books everybody should read. So we're going to just have a little talk we, right before we got on camera. Let's start there because it's controversial. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, Will Durant, the famous writer, said that nations are born stoic and die Epicurean. So they're born hardworking and they die when they party too much. You're also an expert on China. Uh huh. So we were talking about how China is really, how you see China growing. Forbes just this year listed, said that China has surpassed the net worth of the United States. There are more billionaires in China than in the U.S., for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So when you go back and forth to China, what do you see as the main difference that the U.S. and other countries are going to have to do to keep up with China? That's a really a very good question, Tai. Um, I think that uh, before I answer your question, yeah. I do want to make a couple of points. Uh, number one, that in fact, that uh, Tai has been very, very impressive to me. And uh, not only he's good looking and also really <laughs> very thoughtful, okay? And uh, he looks really good on the video, okay? And uh, in fact, if you meet with him uh, in person, he looks better, okay? I like uh, that. I think the, the, the one thing I really feel good about uh, sure. you is the fact that uh, and, uh, you really have so much energy, okay? You're constantly doing your thinking. You constantly want to do something. You really want to change the world. You want to uh, somehow that uh, impact on all the people around you. I think that's kind of a leader that I would be looking for, for sure. So I oh, think that, that uh, this trip to Puerto Rico, if uh, nothing else, I think that's one dimension I really see that in person. That's really not uh, uh, something that you can see on video. I hope that uh, people out there, you realize that uh, with this leader, you're going somewhere, okay? So I think that's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that uh, I think you really have a very, very good eye and uh, seeing the uh, the value of the book that we wrote uh, 10 years ago. Yeah. And um, this book, I, I would have to say that my co-author and uh, Raju, and we put our, and basically that all the wisdom into the book. And the pricing book is very different from uh, the leadership book. Leadership book, you could have every week you have a new fashion, new fad, and the people come up with all kinds of different ideas in terms of what you need to do to be a good leader and so on and so forth. And, uh, but that changes, right? right? Remember that at one point, uh, Jack Walsh yes. was a, such a great leader and every company should do what, uh, whatever Jack Walsh uh, does and uh, make the company as big as possible and, uh, and make it a comprehensive, as comprehensive as possible and so on and so forth. Now people realize that's not the right, right. way to do it. Now he's not right? as respected but as he was. But in pricing, in fact, right. you're going to see that uh, 10 years ago, what we said, still works today. By the way, the China has just translated this book once again. They translate huh. twice, okay? They actually published this book uh, in the end of the December and it's called Innovative Pricing. Basically, they realized that uh, what we put in there is really the science. Science doesn't expire just because uh, time goes by, right. right? So I think that in that sense that uh, you really have a very good eye. I really. I uh, appreciate the fact that uh, you recommend everybody to read the book. Yeah. You really feel yourself. Yeah. Learn something from the book. I think that's something that uh, I feel so good about. Yeah. And uh, in terms of uh, the China and the U.S., I would have to say that uh, when I first came to U.S. in 1980s, yeah. at the time that I noticed that uh, everything in U.S. is done and faster and better. Huh. Okay. Okay. People work so much uh, harder. Okay. And uh, because you can easily just take a photo, take a picture of uh, what people do when they sort of dig a ditch in US mm -hmm. versus what people do in China when they dig a ditch. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can look at uh, how the police do their work and in this country, and then you can look at uh, how the China did the work. 
Okay, at the time, my distinct impression was that uh, U.S. is just was doing everything better. I mean, there is no re there is good reason why U.S. is uh, number one in the in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I have to say that sadly that uh, today, if you go uh, if you do the comparison, because I go to China before the pandemic, probably like uh, nine or ten day uh, ten times a year. I mean, fly back and forth uh, very frequently. Now you realize that in fact that uh, in U.S. basically everything that the U.S. is doing is so much slower. Mm -hmm. Okay, you could have a road that blocked for a whole year, never get repaired. But in China, within a couple of months, everything is paved uh, paved over. Huh. Okay, I mean there's just that kind of a uh, um, difference. So uh, what do you th what does it? I mean, because Americans, uh -huh. you know, I'm American, and we think we have this governmental system. It's not central control like a China, like a Soviet Union used to have. And so we consider our system more efficient. But like you see, also you see TikTok pretty much flying past Instagram and Snapchat. Mm. And that's a Chinese company, and, you know, in five years, almost usurping Facebook and Instagram. So what do you, what's the cause? Is it that people are just more hungry in China? Is the government changing in China or is, some, or is it more a factor that American government is going downhill. Taxation, is it maybe also that you don't, because of virtual work now, you don't have to come to America, so America can't capture as much of the talent in the world. People just stay in Sweden and they build Klarna, and they stay in Canada and they build, you know, Shopify or Ireland Stripe, and so that there's not the competitive advantage we got as Americans from mm -hmm. all that immigration and now America has become pretty yeah. anti-immigration right. which may we may have shot ourselves yeah. in the foot what do you think is the causation of this rise of China well I think before 1980s mm -hmm. when I was in China okay and uh, I remember I was a farmer in fact that uh, uh, in the countryside essentially that uh, and um, and we work together and in fact uh, that uh, regardless of whether you work hard or you don't work hard in the end uh, that you're gonna get more or less the same thing okay, okay? and people really did not have the freedom to do the, do the things that uh, uh, they want to do right okay? there is no way that you can actualize your talent yeah okay. I remember that uh, for the production brigade, for instance, if we have to weed the uh, weeds, okay, and basically that we, we weed the field, and then, then basically that uh, the way we do it is we all lined it up, okay, we all move at the same speed, right? Okay, Just pick it up, yeah. Yeah, you you, I, 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 you can imagine that kind of situation that if you move too fast, I'm right. going to be mad about you, right? Right. right, right, right. Why I want to work so hard, right? Yeah. And uh, but on the other hand, if you work too slow, that's also going to be a problem because yeah. at the end of the year, you probably have nothing to eat, right? So what happened is that everybody will follow the production leader, okay? Yes. Let's say Ty is the leader in the field and uh, how fast that he works really determines how fast we would work, right? Huh. But everybody actually knows that. Yeah. Then we would select the most elderly person to be the leader. Okay? <laughs> you can imagine that that kind of system doesn't really encourage the sort of individual initiatives, the creativity, yeah. and a lot of different things. Okay, and uh, which, by the way, so uh, not to interrupt you, right. that's a pricing of sorts. So that's pricing. People of, yeah, don't absolutely. think about price. Yeah. They think when we talk about pricing, we don't just mean uh -huh. charge fifty dollars at Pier One for a <laughs> curtain. We we we're talking about how you meter out economic rewards. In right. that case, whoever your leader is, is the economy of the field. Right, so people did not have the right incentives. There was absolutely no question. And yeah. then you have the economic reform and then people are allowed to do all kinds of different things. And uh, you can get rich first and then right. all those kind of incentives. Because of that, of course, the people really sort of uh, put their creativity at work. Yep. And then all of a sudden you have an explosion of a creativity. Right. In fact, that uh, and they know that in fact if they work a little bit harder and mm -hmm. they, they can provide more for their family. And uh, in fact, that for the first time in history, in fact, the Chinese people have the freedom. 
and uh, to show people that I have the creativity, I have the actually the energy, right? Mm -hmm. So you allow people to run as fast as you can and get to the objective as fast as you can, right? And I think that that really has motivated a lot of people to work really hard in a very creative way and, and that move the whole society forward very quickly. But if you look at the US, of course, that the US has gone through that process. If you go back to the 1920s and 30s, and, uh, and uh, it's a fair game, right? So it's yes. a free competition. Everybody just put in their bid and uh, see where, uh, and, uh, how, in fact, that your fortune is going to change, OK? But today, of course, that uh, you look at everything, OK? You look at the road building. And uh, you have a lot of safety regulations, mm -hmm. right? And obviously that, uh, and uh, they're all kind of a procedure that put in place that uh, there's cer uh, certain things you can do and cannot do, right? And uh, even if you dig a, a ditch, you probably have a five people that just do the flagging. Right. Okay, the cars right. don't go around and right. so on. And one person doing the, the uh, digging, yeah. right? But in China, everybody's doing digging. Okay, huh. so of course that productivity Because the regulation in be America, it somebody falls different. in the holes, <laughs> right. there's a lawsuit. So <laughs> everybody, lawsuit. is China right. as litigious as America? No, no, not yet. No, no <laughs> one's as litigious. I don't think really. that, uh, that uh, uh, you, would, uh, you would say China is one of those countries that really care a whole lot about law, okay? There is law, I mean, there is no question. Okay, but the law, of course, that uh, is not as rigorous as, as in the U.S. Right. Okay. If you really sort of are in the position of a power, and uh, if you know what to do, and uh, you can always uh, get around it. Yeah. And uh, in fact, that that's a test. Yeah. And whether you already have made it or not, if you have made it, and you're above the law. If you not, if you have not made it, of course, huh. you're subject to the law. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I think in that sense, I think that probably it's not wrong, okay? Yeah. So don't pass the information around, okay? <laughs> don't pass, don't pass. <laughs> right. Now let's switch subjects for a second. I want right. to come back to the China yeah. thing, but I, mm. I agree, you know, I mean, mm. America has become overregulated. Elon Musk had a $3 million lawsuit against him by an employee in California. He lost, and then the judge added 130 of punitive oh. damages. <laughs> the next day, Elon Musk took Tesla out of California and put it in Texas. I don't know if that's related, but they probably are a little bit, if not all. <laughs> um, so the book Smart Pricing, which I've been recommending, is I own a lot of retail brands. I talk to Professor Zhang all the time about, you know, how do we price things at Pier 1 in Steinmart, and Ralph and Russo. We have different, Ralph and Russo's almost the most expensive clothing in the world. It's a brand that I bought. And Pier One is home goods, you know, mm -hmm. huge brands, Radio Shack, these different ones. And one of the chapters in your book that I found so interesting, I think this is the second or third chapter, is that there's only really four levers you can pull in business. Right. First one is gross revenue, top line revenue. You try to get that up. If you wanna make more money, that's where a lot of people go. Secondly, you can focus on your fixed costs, the cost of your rent, the cost of your employees. Third, variable cost, the cost of whatever you're selling. If you're selling a couch, you can try to negotiate the cost of the couch down. And, though, and then there's a fourth one, which is optimizing your pricing. But everybody I meet as entrepreneurs, they mostly talk to me about gross revenue. Sometimes I'll talk about profit. But I mean, by the way, these four levers are what create profit. But so people go, I want to make more money. You need my gross revenue up. Or hey, I figured out a way to cut my costs. Or hey, I can deliver the product for cheaper. Mm. But in your book, you have this graph, mm. and it shows that that's exa almost exactly backwards, right. depending on your industry. So I'm in retail, e-commerce. In your book, it's like if you can optimize pr pricing by 1%, mm. you can get a 20% swing in your profit. Right. And then the next one is variable costs, mm. negotiating that you know, and like 1% optimization gets you 15 or something like that. Fixed costs gets you like 1% optimization gets you like 5% increase. And top line is teeny. Right. Top line, in fact, you can often go broke focused on the top line. So right. let's talk about that for a second because mm -hmm. I've had some questions when I explain that right. to people and uh -huh. I'll, I've got the source right here, <laughs> right. the co-author. Uh -huh. When you say optimizing your pricing strategy by 1% can uh -huh. give you a 20% lift mm -hmm. in profitability, yeah. is it as simple as saying make one little tweak and yeah. you see people's 
net income go up by 20% in an industry like retail? Right. So it may not be as simple as that. And uh, but certainly one of the things that uh, we have found, uh, I personally, I only do the uh, pricing research. Uh, I only teach you pricing and also I only do pricing uh, consulting. Okay. And uh, over the years, of course, that we cover all kind of different industries and work with a large number of uh, uh, executives who have a responsibility for revenues. And what we found that was basically that uh, and most companies actually pay a lot of attention to value creation. Okay, so they work with the employees, empower the employees, and that reduce the production costs, and make sure that you create the most valuable product you can put out there in the marketplace. And uh, but when it comes to the value capture, and the fact that you have to set the price to capture part of the value, so that you as a firm can be profitable, so you can serve those customers forever, right? And uh, firms don't really think it twice about it. Yeah. Okay, that's really sad. Because uh, I used to be a farmer. In fact, I was mm -hmm. uh, a educated youth in China. I was uh, sent to the countryside and work with the farmers. And uh, and so uh, to me, that uh, that's just so odd. Somebody because uh, you basically what you're trying to do is that you work for a whole year. You created this uh, bumper harvest, mm -hmm. okay? And at the time of harvesting, you said let's just take it easy. Right. Okay. Farmers will never do that. But yeah. our executives actually do that. They don't pay much attention to the price and how you're going to capture the value. What are the different things you could do to capture the value for the firm and also make the customers happier? Yeah. Right? Wouldn't you want to be in that situation that the customers are happier and you make more profit so that we have a actually mutually beneficial relationship for a long time? I mean, that's exactly what you want to do with the peer one, right? Yeah. And so in that sense, I think that uh, it definitely is the case that a, firm, a lot of firms don't do this. Okay, if you come back to the numbers, in fact, it is indeed the case that uh, by any kind of a calculation, based on any kind of an industry, we use numbers across different industries. You can actually look it up in the smart pricing book and then you're gonna see that in different industries. The ranking order has always been that the price is the most effective or profit driver. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, relative to everything else. You can imagine why that's the case. Simply because as a firm's working on everything else for so long, I mean, at some point, you're gonna reach the, uh, the point of a diminishing return. Yeah. Right? And the pricing really stands out. In retailing business, that's especially the case. Just imagine that uh, if you sell every product in the retail setting and for one more dollar. Right. Okay? That multiplied by the 10 overs over the course of the year. How many units you are selling? That's a huge amount of money. Yeah. Okay. But the problem is that a lot of people don't really think in that direction, and they are not really thinking that. Uh, okay, so within the store, I have hundreds of thousands of different products. Each one of the products, the consumers are really paying different attention, and they probably care about the price to a varying degree. Yeah. Right? If that's the case, why you cannot really find a way and to make a customer feel that they're paying a, a pretty low price, and yet as a firm, we make more profitability so we can serve you better. Yeah. Right. So that's essentially what we are trying to do in the book. Yeah. yeah. And so, it, it, you know, we were talking yesterday when you mm -hmm. got here that if you look at an innovative, there's a couple different things that I always think of as innovative pricing. And one of them doesn't work. So let's think about airlines. Airlines uh -huh. are pretty dynamic yeah. pricing, right? So they don't do, in the book you'll read, there's a couple ways people price. Cost plus is the most common. You buy something for 10 bucks and you mark it up, you know, to 15 bucks, kind uh -huh. of a flat percentage. Yeah. Uh, and then there's competition based where you look at your competitors and go, oh, well, they're selling this couch for 50, uh, you know, 500 bucks. I, I can't sell it for 600, nobody will buy. That's competition based. But uh -huh. there are these more dynamic ways. So you go to an airline, if you're ever on an airplane, ask everybody sitting next to you what they paid. Probably the person next to you paid either a little more or a little less. So airlines have this sophisticated- Probably a lot more, a lot less. Yeah, a lot, <laughs> yeah they have this algorithm that's based that on, so. you know, a predictive model and how many seats there are left in the time of the day and the weather, but they're not very profitable. Right. I mean, you look at Louis Vuitton <laughs> on the flip side, right. which probably uses maybe a less sophisticated mm. model, but they mm. have huge margin. The most profitable margin 
retail business in the world is Louis Vuitton. I have like 30% net margins. But then there's a third one that I thought mm. was interesting mm. we talked about yesterday, which is Google yeah. AdWords. Yeah. So Google, I was listening to Peter Thiel, the co-founder of PayPal with Elon mm. Musk. And mm. he said he likes monopolistic businesses. He wrote uh-huh. that book, Zero to One. Yeah. And he says yeah, a yeah, great yeah. example of it is Google. Uh-huh. But he doesn't talk about, in this YouTube I was watching, he doesn't talk about the reason Google has captured the value as a monopoly. Because you could mm-hmm. be a monopoly and go broke. Right. But he was a, they captured value with Google AdWords as an auction. Yeah. And you said your mentor yeah. or advisor uh-huh. is the one who built that for them. Right. So how can more businesses do like, like, is there a way I could take Pier 1 and create an auction for everything? Right. I mean, we have 100,000 SKUs, so I'm trying to, I like to learn from the best. What, what can the average entrepreneur watch learn from the most, and maybe there's other really good pricing systems. Yeah. Well, I, I'm obviously that you raise a large number of questions in the process of uh, your commentary. And uh, I think that uh, and certainly that if you look into the airline industry, you would say that the airline industry probably is the most sophisticated the pricer. I and mean, there was no question about yeah. it. They do the yield management uh, and a uh, long time ago, and uh, they use a lot of a uh, data process and, and uh, try to assess customer willingness to pay in different kinds of situations. And then they would uh, basically sell every seat and uh, to the people who are willing to pay the most. Right. And uh, yet to that, if you look at the whole They're industry, broke. it's not very profitable. <laughs> right. I think that there is a good irony there. And in fact, that's what we wrote in the book uh, too, is basically that, uh, Individually as a firm, in fact, uh, when you have a pricing flexibility, it's good for you, okay? If a competition doesn't do anything, if you're flexible, you can always offer all kinds of different deals and steal the customers away from the competition. But the problem in the airline industry is that everybody also have the same flexibility, right. which means that everybody have a lot of different weapons to hurt each other. Imagine that if you have a game where that uh, you have uh, people who have a lot of weapons to hurt each other, in the end, what will happen? Right, everybody kills everybody. Everybody right. gets get, get hurt. Right, so that's exactly what happened in the airline industry. When you talk about the Google, for instance, uh, Google, of course, that uh, has been very smart. In fact, this is a uh, so-called uh, the and uh, and two-sided market. Yeah. Okay, uh, Google actually is supported by the search engine. Search engine, of course, serve the end user who does yeah. the search and also serve the uh, advertisers. Yes. Right. Uh, in this case, in fact, as a Google, I can charge both the searchers. Yes. I can also charge the uh, charge the um, uh, the people who basically advertise. Yes. Right? And in this case, in fact, that there is actually good economic principle that basically yes. says that in this kind of a case, you want to charge the side that less, that's more price elastic. Yes. You want to charge the side more, that's more price inelastic. So that's why they okay. charge the that's why they charge the most to the advertiser. Right. So in fact, you can yeah. go to the extreme. It's basically saying that I'm gonna only gonna charge the uh, customers. Uh, I'm only gonna charge advertisers. Yes. I'm not gonna charge the uh, searchers because yes. uh, there are more eyeballs. You're gonna enhance the value of uh, my service to the advertisers. You can charge even more yeah. to the advertiser because of that feedback loop. Yes. In that case, uh, of course, uh, for Google, that uh, you actually want to charge uh, advertisers, not uh, the end users. Yeah. End YouTube users is basically use for free, right? Yes. Exactly. So in that case, you generate more eyeballs. When I deliver those eyeballs to the uh, customers, uh, to the advertisers, of course, they are willing to pay more. Yeah. So the point I want to mention that is that uh, in pricing, it's really very different from anything else, right? You can imagine if you're a leader, if you're a manager, and uh, and you work with the people, there are a lot of intuition and uh, that uh, they'll guide you in terms of how you're going to treat people nice and motivate people to work a little bit harder right. and to get the uh, most creativity out of the people and so on and so forth. But that's not the case in pricing. Okay, mm-hmm. You really have to understand some of the uh, principles behind it. Simply because what you're trying to do is really put in place the economic incentives that will motivate people to do the things you want them to do. Mm-hmm. And you induce the right behaviors. Yeah. Right? 
So in that situation, what I'm saying is that uh, coming back to the uh, peer one, for instance, obviously the situation is going to be different, right? The product itself is going to be different. The kind of a customer who come to you are very different. And in order for us to do the best possible pricing in that particular market, obviously we have to understand who are those customers yep. and uh, what kind of incentive I can put in place to induce the right behavior from everybody so that we are uh, the best pricer and for the product like this, right? So that's a little bit different. So I would say that um, it is definitely very relevant to compare the peer one and uh, with Google. And but there that uh, they, I think that uh, the comparison and ends. And uh, if you actually don't actually and uh, pay attention to special characteristics of that particular market in the peer one, and also the what customers are looking for and then so on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because we don't have nobody yeah. comes to our Pier One website that's there to just get a search result like they right. are on Google. Right. But one of the things I hope you take away from this episode is just that you have to become sophisticated on pricing. It's funny. There's millions of people on social media, and I see all these people that are like really sophisticated. For example, entrepreneurs with their fitness program. They're like, Ty, take this vitamin, I do this yoga exercise when I wake up at this and then and that. And then, but I'm like, what's your pricing strategy? And it's like the most primitive caveman. It's like, I don't know, I charge what my- I'm gonna do 30% over the- uh, Yeah, 30% price. over, <laughs> or a lot of people. Let's talk for a second about people who yeah. are following who have service businesses. So yeah. if you're a lawyer, realtor, although that's just a little more fixed, but I have people that I've trained to start marketing agencies, right? Mm -hmm. So. One of the things that I did when I started teaching with marketing agency program in 2016, and I said, listen, there's not a lot of people who know how to do Facebook ads. Mm. Most restaurants, most doctor's offices are really have a, every new client you bring them is very valuable. Yeah. So you can just start off charging a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. You get 10 customers paying you a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Now you have a six figure business right. that's almost all profit. Yeah. But maybe now as you think through it, if you could charge a thousand, how do you know whether you should charge fifteen hundred? Or if somebody's watching and they're a lawyer, you know, yeah. or a, a CPA, if you're watching this, mm. it'd be just because everybody else is charging four hundred bucks an hour, maybe you should charge three hundred, or maybe you should charge five hundred. So, how do you think an average business owner who maybe doesn't have a huge right. sample set, what's a, some some ways that they can become more sophisticated in how they price their services? Well, yeah, for lawyers, I mean, I don't really sort of a deal with lawyers a lot. And, um, and, uh, so I always uh, stay and far away from the law. And, uh, how, about, how about a consultant? Just say because a consultant. Of that, yeah. But one of the things I always notice is that as a lawyer, for instance, you always uh, sort of uh, keep one third of uh, whatever money you recover for your client. Right. Okay? And that's for a good reason. And uh, the, for a good reason, somebody because, uh, for instance, if I hire a Thai as a lawyer for me, right? And the moment that we sign the contract, how do I know that you're going to work on my behalf and then put right. the, uh, put everything into it, right? Yes. And uh, and uh, try to maximize the recovery yes. and uh, and uh, for me, yes. okay? Because you you're going to have a lot of work to do, right? So you basically sort of uh, you have a case number one, case number two. You have a kids to take care of, uh, your wife to take care of, and all kind of different things to take care of. And how do I know that behind my back that you actually put in uh, everything you got? Yes. and into this particular case and help me, okay? So in this case, essentially that as a client, of course, I want to align my interest with yours, mm -hmm. right? So if you recover more money and you get more money yourself, right. and I would get, also get more money. So in that case, of course, this is so-called the performance-based pricing and we align our interests, right? You see that in a lot of a complicated agency problem, right? Mm -hmm. Like the realtors, yes. I also pay you 6%. Right. right, so on average, right? If you go to IPO, for instance, investment banking, they always charge you 7% of whatever achieved the IPO value, mm -hmm. okay? The reason is because once I put a 7% in there, I just know that that should be enough incentive for you to work on my behalf yes. to maximize whatever the IPO value that you can achieve, okay? And indeed, that, that, that also stabilizes the, the price competition. Nobody, I as a client, I will never ask a time, can you reduce the rate to 6%? Even if right. you agree to it, I probably don't feel good about it. 
right? Yeah. Because I'm I'm shooting myself in the yeah, foot by you taking away your incentive. Yeah, you just go to the uh, go to the ocean and then and do the surfing instead of working on my behalf. Right? Yeah. How do I know, right? So that's essentially that kind of a consideration that uh, you're gonna make. So what I'm saying is that um, in terms of what pricing. Price is nothing else but the economic incentive you put in place to motivate all the people around you and, uh, and the relevant to this particular business to do the right thing. Yeah. Okay, so that's how complicated it is. You can imagine you have to think really hard about this. Whose incentive, how you're going to align the yeah. trend, what kind of incentive different people may have and uh, how I'm going to align all those different incentives. If you align them well, Ultimately, what will happen is that everybody should do well. Yes. Right. So that's why working in pricing is just such a fun thing to do. Okay. And simply because we look into the people's uh, incentives and motivations and what they want to do, how we're going to induce the right behavior from people. That's what you, you're thinking of. Yeah. Because you think about taxes, for example, that's yeah. the government price to live in a country. So, right. or to live in it. the state of California has this really high tax. Right. And they have to think about, I don't think they're thinking about it very intelligently, but <laughs> if you overprice, California has the highest, whatever, 13%, yeah. guess what happens? People go, now I'm going to move to Arizona or Texas. And you raise the tax, but you actually collect less money. Yeah. yeah and yeah, then absolutely. who leaves first? Talk yeah. about it's worse. If right. you think it's not going to be people not making much money because people are not making oh, much money. Yeah. So what happens is all the people who used to pay the most taxes leave. So France did this, for example. They, they imposed, they tried to impose a tax on your net worth, even if you hadn't actually liquidated your net yeah, worth, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And all these millionaires moved yeah, mobile, from France yeah, yeah. Yeah. to Belgium yeah. overnight. Yeah. They lost like yeah. half their yeah. millionaires. Yeah. So then well, you, you get less. So you also have to think about, like yeah. you said, when you're pricing something, like if you're hiring a lawyer or an investment bank yeah. and you're doing it on a contingency basis, you mm. maybe don't want to negotiate down too far. <laughs> also, no. if they say uh -huh. yes, they're also signaling right. maybe that they don't have any other you options. Would so at minimum, you would suspect that that's the case. Something's yeah. wrong with I them. I think that what you just said is exactly right. And the fact that if you put high taxes in place, right, and people like a Thai may move to Puerto Rico. Okay. Yeah. And uh, from California, <laughs> California, of course, is a beautiful place. And uh, uh, not only that, I think in addition to that, there are people who would normally do more work simply because if I do more work, I got like 80% of my income uh, and tax away. Why do I want to do that? Yes. I probably would just spend the time with my kids. Yes. Okay? So for those people, remember that uh, when the uh, high taxes hit those people, those are the most talented people. These are the most creative people. These are the people that society should reward more so that you can bring everybody up. Yeah. Right. But because of the fact that you change that those kind of taxes, they work less. Yes. And the whole society suffers because of it. Yeah. Right. We have to recognize the fact that uh, it is the case that there are people who do more and then the others. There are people who are more capable than the others. Right. We certainly want to have equity. There is no, absolutely no question. I think that uh, if you don't have a more equitable society and uh, I think that there are going to be all kind of different issues. But on the other hand, you have to recognize that the different people are making different contributions. Yeah. And uh, those are the people who make more contributions should be rewarded in some way, right? Yeah. And that's only fair, and that's probably good for the society, that's good for the uh, US as a whole. And the thing about it that I would yeah. add to it, forget, like you said, like economics, macroeconomics, or psychology, even, let's say you want the world to be more equitable. Sometimes you have to do what seems non-equitable, uh -huh. and the repercussions are things become more equitable. For example, going back to the California situation, mm -hmm. if you want Californians to have a nice life and less crime and so on, um, you want to have people there employing people. So there's jobs, for example, and government just handing out money actually doesn't create the same kind of happiness for somebody's life. So mm -hmm. people who work for their money are happier. Wow. Interestingly, in California, crime is through the roof in California. And I'm telling you, every person that I know that's made money is leaving or thinking of leaving. And they don't, those are the people that 
employ people and also don't commit that many crimes. Maybe people would say they do white collar crimes, but they don't shoot you in the face. And so I saw an article in LA, somewhere in LA Times something this weekend that LAPD was saying to tourists, don't come, we can't protect you. (laughs) Think about that, California, you know? So pricing by the government has repercussions. We talked about firms. What about hiring? A lot of people who work or watch me, you know, are employers and you're trying to hire a freelancer, you're trying to hire a secretary, a business partner. Um, With my business partner, Alex, in Pier 1, we just kind of were like, at the beginning, let's just do this 50-50. That works pretty well in many ways. (laughs) If I'm Uh tired, yeah. He has a lot of incentive to work. When <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, when I'm, if he's sick, yeah, yeah. I have a lot of incentive. Do you think that the average in company doesn't do enough real incentives? I mean, when Bill Gates went public, I think it was 1986, 12,000 of his employees became millionaires. It's kind uh, of a cool story. Yeah, yeah. You know, so he had built Sam Walton in his book, Made in America, says, make your employees own a piece of what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that holds true as the science there that there's a, because it seems common sense, but I know you've studied. Uh, there you know, is a definitely that, uh, I mean, this is uh, the not something new, right? So there is a, this is so-called uh, efficiency wage theory, okay? okay? So which means that uh, if you pay people above the market price, yes. and which means you pay a little bit more than what uh, it takes to hire somebody, okay? That somebody is gonna work a little bit harder. Mm-hmm. And the reason is somebody because if you, if I look all around, I know that uh, this particular job is gonna uh, actually pays more, and because it pays more, therefore I'm not gonna look around, right? I want to do everything possible to hold on to this job, yes. and because of that, of course, that uh, you would increase the productivity from that worker, you will reduce the labor turnover, and uh, of course, ultimately, is beneficial to the company uh, itself, mm-hmm. right? I remember that uh, I got into the business uh, simply because one day I was wandering into the uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania library and and there was a a book that was just put on the table by somebody. And that was uh, the scientific management by uh, Frederick uh, Winslow Taylor. Okay, so this is so-called father of uh, management. So his idea at the time was basically that uh, you can do some time study of uh, your employees, right? You see that your employees do a lot of uh, uh, things and uh, in a very ad hoc way, which means uh, I have a certain habits. I, I probably would have a lot more moves to to do, to to process a certain part of uh, the uh, production process, right? And. Uh, because of that, you can imagine that a lot of inefficiencies in the yeah. process. Tell me so about what uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor did was basically saying that, why don't I just really study, ideally, what kind of a move you really need to have, and how long it should take, and to do every one of those moves. And ultimately, that how am I going to actually increase the production? Okay, so he does the uh, time study. Once you do the time study, he went to the worker, basically says, so how about this? I offer you this particular deal. And uh, I increase your salary, let's suppose, by 30% or 50% or double your salary if you do what I tell you to do. Yeah. Okay, what I tell you to do is that when you move this product to here, you do this way, not the way you, you're doing. And you, when you move the next process, you do this way, not that somebody else, uh, and the way you, you would do it. Yeah. Okay. In that case, you reduce the time and the increase the efficiency to produce the product. Ultimately, that even if you double the salary, the company as a whole will gain a tremendous amount from it. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at the China, in, indeed, uh, that that's one of the things that's happening. Somebody because uh, think about it, China actually since the 1980s experienced economic growth and the GDP growth is like 10 percent every year. Yeah, huge. And uh, the salaries people get get the increase and doubled and doubled. Okay, and what kind of a motivation that really provide to you in terms of uh, every day? What do you think about? Yes, right. You can think about the work. How I'm going to do it better, yes. and because of there's a lot of opportunities out there, and I can do way better for myself, and so on and so forth. I think that's one of the philosophy you believe in. I mean, I talked to you, and you basically thought about really believe in that. It's not like uh, just you want to do well and uh, push everybody and to work as hard as possible, and uh, so that I can do well. 
Right. It is the case that you want to actually sort of everybody around you to do well. Right. And the way to do well is basically that you do it efficiently and, uh, and follow a specific direction. Yeah. Right? And the direction I charted for you. I think that probably is the right way to do things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and like you said, I like how you said ad hoc. You know, the average per, yeah. when I have 480 people that work for me in one of my holding companies, retail e commerce ventures. And mm. when you look there, it's like you said, sometimes I, it's like, 480 different backgrounds, lifestyle, education, childhoods. And so your job as the leader, as a CEO, is like you said, you have to say, listen, the way you answer emails is too slow. <laughs> yeah, I was work. I had, so I have employees that'll fly out. I had some fly out and I was watching one of them use the laptop and I was thinking, you're, you're wasting an hour a day because they don't have a mouse. So they're going, every time they close a window, they have to bring, they're moving their finger on the little touchpad. And I was thinking, <laughs> it's like you said, going back to pricing, I could pay that person more per hour. Let's say they were an hourly person, pay them more per hour. They could have more vacation or change more rest habit. time. Yeah. yeah, if they change their habit, yeah. I win because I could pay them less. They'd actually make less per day job completed, right. they get more free time yeah. and a higher wage per hour working. Yeah. But people don't, I talked to you about this well, yesterday, I, I people think, don't like to learn. Yeah. I mean, it's not that they don't like to learn, it's not in our DNA yeah. to really be open to change after a no, certain point. No, I, I think that's a very old American idea. I certainly that when I moved from China to US and as a student, that's one of the first ideas I learned. I was, think, I was thinking, wow, this is basically why the U.S. was so strong, right? And ultimately that everybody put the best uh, into the job and yes. uh, they get the most out of the job. And uh, ultimately the firm is better off and the employees are better off and the society as a whole is better off, right? Yeah. And uh, somehow that uh, that philosophy is just not very fashionable today, right? Yeah, it's and, more, it's more uh, fashionable really in China. That's really disturbing. Yeah. yeah, that's really disturbing. Because you go to China, in fact, that uh, indeed that the people and uh, do have that kind of spirit. They think that if yeah. I put more into it, I'm yes. going to get more out of it. And the company is doing is going to do better. And the company in the end, of, the, of course, will keep me longer too. Yes, right? exactly. Just that's that's your company. job security. <laughs> right, exactly. Doing it and, well uh, and efficient, that's your job security. Nobody lets somebody go, yeah. that's an outlier. I, I think that uh, we do need to keep this uh, big, big picture in, yes. in, in our mind. Right. So whenever we are sort of making some kind of a demands and doing certain things, you have to think, uh, think of that ultimately and all those things where they're going to need to. Yeah, I think that that's actually very important, and to have that big picture in mind. Yeah. Well, this was awesome. As we come to the end, I <laughs> want to tell everybody: remember, a lot of takeaways. Most important one that I've learned is become more sophisticated as you think about pricing, as you think about what you're going to charge for your services, as you think about how you compensate people who work for you, business partners. If you're a service provider, like a lawyer, accountant, a marketing agency, think a little deeper about how you're gonna price things. Right. But start with this book, I don't get paid to tell you this, but <laughs> Smart Pricing, it's on tylopez.com yeah. slash books. Thank you for coming. We, we don't get paid to read, write the book, okay? <laughs> so no. we want the people to know and all the, I think that we feel passionate about and that that's really the truth, okay? And um, I, I think that uh, in terms of our pricing, if you look into that book, it's really not about how you do things in different industry for different kind of a situation and so on and so forth. So, and those things we do talk about. Yes. But ultimately pricing is really about way of thinking. Yes. The thinking is basically that how are you going to put the economic incentive in place in such a way that you will motivate everybody to do the right thing. Yes. Okay. When the uh, the famous econ English economist uh, and uh, Adam Smith uh, was talking about the invisible hand, hand invisible hand, and that, that really sort of uh, direct people uh, and, uh, and for the and uh, to do things that's ultimately good for the society. Yeah. And the price is that invisible yeah. hand. And yeah. uh, so I think that if you really want to understand the role for invisible hand 
how yeah. invisible hand would uh, change and uh, and motivate the people around you to do the things that ultimately not only for individuals for the company and also for society as a whole you got to look into pricing and i think this book is something you definitely want to read awesome well thanks for coming all right <laughs> good all right <laughs>